grandparents are special people with wisdom and pride. They are always offering love and kindness and are always there to guide. They often make you feel so confident and strong. Their arms are always open no matter what you did wrong. They try to help out in every way that they can. They love all their grandchildren the same, whether you're a child, woman, or man. They are always there to listen and to lend a helping hand. They show you respect and they try to understand. They give their love, devotion, and so much more that's easy to see. Grandparents were perfect examples of the kind of person that we should be. Happy Grandparents Day! Please bow your head and close your eyes for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings. We thank you for our school, G. Peters, and our new principal, Miss Jeffrey, and our teachers and staff. Heavenly Father, we also give you thanks today for our grandparents. We give you thanks for the love and support from our real grandparents and our church grandparents. Father, please continue to provide blessings and protection over them. In your name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My name is Gavin Evans and I'm in the fifth grade. My name is Gabrielle Evans and I'm in the eighth grade. And we're gonna sing the school song. Out from a dream you came, so that all God's children could learn of his name. With prayer and work you came to be a school helping children reach victory. We've learned to laugh, we've learned to care, We've learned to love Jesus, his blessings we share. G. E. Peters, G. E. Peters, G. E. Peters, you help make a difference in me. Learning to make the grade. Keeping faith in times when life will fade. A place where God's love and peace abound. A place where his beauty can always be found. We'll stand with the best, we'll pass life's test. Achieve all our goals so the world can be blessed. G. E. Peters. G. E. Peters. G. E. Peters, you help make a difference in me. You help make a difference in me. You help make a difference in me. Good morning. My name is Zuri Brockway. On behalf of G. E. Peters, we'd like to welcome you to Grandparents Day. I hope you have a great day. For all those times you stood by me For all the truth that you made me see For all the joy you brought to my life For all the wrong that you made right For every dream you made come true You've been 
I'm with my grandparents. I'll be interviewing them for grandparents today. Hi, Dana. Hello, Dana. Okay, my first question is, where were you born? What was your house like as a child? Well, both Pop Pop and I were born in Sanford, Florida, and our parents moved from Sanford to Rochester, New York, and um, they were migrant workers. Our parents picked apples in a little town outside of Rochester called Sodas. So we lived there. Pop Pop family remained in Sodas while my family moved to the big city of Rochester. In terms of the family, I was the oldest of eight children. So my dad bought a house in the city of Rochester. And uh, you can imagine it was a very uh, busy household because there were so many kids. Okay. Yeah, my, my father and mother uh, lived a little while in Rochester, but they moved to Williamson, New York, which is near Sodas. And uh, I have two younger, bro two older brothers, and uh, one foster brother and one foster sister. And uh, we had a very busy household also, just like uh, Mimi's household. Okay. Well, this it also says one for the second one, so we're just going to say number two. What is different about growing up today than when you were a child? Oh, wow. I think the major difference is the technology. I mean, people are using computers, they're on <clears throat> Facebook, you know, there is a, they're using cell phones. We didn't have any of that at all when we were growing up. In fact, I don't remember seeing a computer until I think I was, um, I was a teacher. Okay, I had I had a computer in my classroom when I was a teacher. Yes, children, we just had a little TV, mostly black and white when we were really little, and uh, we had three channels. Mm. So uh, there wasn't a whole lot to choose from. But uh, other than that, uh, uh, growing up today also presents some challenges. Uh, and we have to uh, meet them whenever we can, whether it's uh, the problems of our society and what has to be done to protect our children. Try to do that. Okay. Third question. What historical time period did you grow up in? Civil rights movement or school segregation? Because you put Harlem Renaissance. So we don't mm, Yeah. Well, I remember... When I was a teenager, I remember a lot about Martin Luther King. I would turn the television on and I would see Martin Luther King um, speaking. I would see all the demonstrations. I would see uh, all the problems, the social problems that were going on about that time. And um, in fact, you know, my parents, growing up in, in Rochester, New York, my parents really didn't want me to go south. I went to school at, at Oakwood College at the time, it's called Oakwood College. And my parents didn't really want me to go south because of all of the problems that were occurring in the south. But um, I can remember when Martin Luther King was killed. I remember sitting in Cunningham Hall and actually seeing his, his funeral on television. I was a freshman at Oakwood at the time. It was in 1968. Yes, I was a, I was a senior at that time uh, and at Atlantic Union College in Massachusetts. And so I grew up uh, during the civil rights period. Uh, and uh, I remember all that she talked about as well. Go ahead. Okay. What is your favorite childhood memory? Oh, my favorite childhood memory, oh wow, was um, uh, when I was in the second grade, I had a teacher who was black. Her name was Miss Scott. Miss Scott was the only black teacher I had in elementary and in high school. 
And it wasn't until I got to Oakwood that I had other black teachers, other black instructors. So my very first black teacher was a second was when I was in the second grade. And that was a very special time for me because she looked just like me. And that was real special. When I was about 11, my mom and dad bought a house in the country, Williamson. And we had a vineyard in the backyard, it grew grapes. And my father and mother used to pick the grapes and make grape juice. And man, was that good. <laughs> that was one of my favorite memories. Okay, so Mimi pretty much answered the um, fifth, fifth question, I guess. Um, did you have a teacher that played a big part in your life? She pretty much already answered that, so I'll yeah. ask you, Papa. Yeah, I had a first grade teacher, and uh, I knew him all, the, all my life because he uh, came to our weddings many years later. And uh, he played an important part. I had lots of teachers, though. In college, I had uh, good teachers sometimes, and of course, in graduate school. So I had, we call them mentors, people who told us how to live and how to do our work. And, uh, you know, I had plenty of them. Last but not least, what is an advice that you will give to the youth of today? Well, I think the advice that I would give to young people is to talk with your parents about the social issues of the day. Uh, talk with them about why people are marching and protesting today, why there are signs, why when you look on television, you see um, people carrying signs that say Black Lives Matter. You know, there's so much going on and, and it's important to vote. So talk with your parents about voting so that when it's time for you to vote, you will be able to think critically about what's really important. It's very important to talk to older people to get their experiences. You don't want to make the mistakes they made. And you want to benefit from the things that they did right. So uh, don't be afraid to talk to older people and ask them questions. Uh, that will make your life easier. Don't be, and make sure you study hard and because uh, your job is going to school. And you will benefit if you do well in school for the rest of your life. Hi, Ms. Morrow. I'm so glad and thankful that we have you here today um, for to celebrate Grandparents Day. You are now a grandparent, am I right? Yes, four times. Four times. Can you tell me about your grandkids? I have a daughter who uh, is in her second year at McDaniel College, granddaughter. Okay. And then I have three little ones. I have one who's going into second grade, a little boy who's just starting kindergarten, and a new baby who's only nine months. Wow, four grandkids. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Ms. Morrill was our reading specialist for the last how many, six years? Eight. It's been eight years? Yeah, I figured it out. Eight years, wow. And we really, really, really miss her. But we're so thankful that she came to join us today. So we want to find out a little bit about you, Ms. Morrill. So we have some questions here for you. Okay. Um, nope. Okay. Tell us about your childhood. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? What was it like? I was born in Brooklyn, New York. And I can talk like that anytime I want to. <laughs> but I'm from New York. Um, grew up in a brownstone that I lived with my mom and dad and my brother and my aunt. And her friend and my aunt and uncle were upstairs and their two kids. So extended family in one brownstone. Okay. Um, do you want to tell us what decade that was? That was uh, the late 40s, early 50s. Wow. Okay. The late 40s, early 50s. Um, what is different? I know there's a lot of things different today than it was when you were growing up, but what really stands out to you? Um, I guess that we played outside all the time. Um, I don't think we had a TV till I was like six or seven. So, you know, there was no electronic. We had one phone in the house that was on the phone table in the corner. Um, and it was one of those 
that if you picked it up, you might hear someone else talking because it what we didn't have like our own line. It was like shared line. There, like, so how did y'all know when to like if you wanted to get on? Like did if there was nobody it? on there, then you could dial, of course. But people could call, could just pick up and start talking into your telephone conversations. Yeah, you could hear someone. Oh, someone's on, so you could have to hang up. Wow. So okay. I guess none of the electronics. We played outside a lot. Um, we had a tiny, tiny backyard um, that still played outside. Okay, let me ask you something. Did everybody in your school look like you? You know, I've thought about this recently with all that's going on. I think in my elementary school, yes. I did have one of my best friends was a Latinx, so the Latina. Um, but everyone else, I think, was pretty much white. I don't think I had anyone of color in my class till I got to high school. Okay. So you got to high school. Let's see what else we can ask you. Um, so if you grew up in the 40s and 50s, that was like right at the hot, getting into the hotbed of the civil rights movement. Am I right? Mm -hmm. you, what do you remember about that? Were you involved in it? Was something that we stayed away from? Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of other grandparents. Some of them, they were told, like my parents were told, you don't get involved with that because that's dangerous stuff. So wow. what about you? Do you remember anything about that? I, you know, I have a very clear memory of looking at, I guess it was Life magazine. And on the back page, it had a picture of two water fountains, one for whites only and one for, for I think it said for colored. Right, but and it was like that in New York, right? In, in New York, they didn't have separate water fountains, right? No. Okay. So I, don't, I guess this was taken. And I just remember being astounded by it and like asking my parents, I don't understand this. What is this? You know, and I was probably like 10 or 11 or something like that. Okay. Um, so, so do my you remember, first. like, um, do you remember, like, any protests or marches or things going on or when, like, people died? I know you remember when, like, John F. Kennedy died, no? Or was you too young for Absolutely. that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay. Because that's, like, the thing when I talk to people, they really, no matter where they were, my mother was, I think, in Jamaica or something, and she remembers when John F. Kennedy died. Like, it was a big deal um, to people. I, I was in high school, and they sent us home. Wow. We all got sent home, and I was walking home, and everyone was crying. I remember that. I, can imagine. I, can imagine. I, didn't, I don't think I started going to protest march to the Vietnam era. Ah, so That's you were involved really, in Vietnam? Protest. Absolutely. That's when I really started thinking for myself and becoming more active and um, trying to understand what was going on. Was and it that scary? Like, well, it was scary in that I had a lot of friends who went to Vietnam, a lot of boyfriends. Uh -huh. I wrote hundreds of letters to guys in Vietnam. Um, I lost one, which was my boyfriend. Um, so the Vietnam War was really important. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, if those that don't know, for the kids that don't know, the Vietnam War was a it was a a, a really contested war. Like people didn't feel oh. good about it. A lot of people felt like we shouldn't be involved in that war. So there were a lot of protests, black and white, about sending our boys off to Vietnam. Um, let me ask you. Uh, you worked in the Hyattsville PG County neighborhood for a long time, right? How many right. years? I was in public school for 35 years or something. You know, I just figured it out. This would have been my, four, I've been in education for 48 years. Let me ask you something and, and we're going to wrap up with this. How would you say kids have changed at the beginning of your teaching experience and then to now? Or have they not changed at you all? Know, I, Kids are kids are kids. You know, whether you're teaching in public school, private school, Christian school, um, hippy dippy schools, which I taught in, um, no matter the color of their skin, I mean, they're still kids, especially at elementary age kids, and that's mostly what I had. Mm -hmm. um, they're always eager to learn and, and love their teachers, and you get excited because they're excited and um, they make you laugh. I mean, that's right. what I love about kids, they make me laugh yeah. every day. They do. Ms. Moore, we are so glad that you joined us today. And I want to thank you so much for conducting this interview with me. I'm awesome. so, so thankful. And I'll make sure that you tune in and I'll get you a copy of the program. OK, um, we'll do. All right, let's everybody say bye to Ms. Moore. Thank bye, you. I love you all. All right, Ms. Moore, thank you for doing this. OK. So thank you for doing this interview for G. Peters.
Grandparents Day. So tell us about your grandkids. My grandkids are Solomon, Sanaya, London, and Levi, the Johnsons. My and what grade are they in? Solomon's in the fifth grade, Sanaya's in the third grade, and London and Levi start in first grade. Okay. So it stands out as one of the major differences for like kids growing up now and kids growing up then. I think having both parents in the house two strong parents and also their grandparents. If you had a grandmother or a grandfather, some paternal figure in that house so that child would know that coming home, they would be coming home to an empty house or somebody was looking out after them, a next door neighbor. Back then, everybody knew each other. My God's mother lived next door to us. My grandmother always came up and helped my mother with, with us. So we always had someone at home. My mother either worked at night in the evenings from like 3 to 11 or 11 to 7. So there was always an adult at home when we were there. And what was your mother doing working at night? My mother worked at a hospital, a women's hospital. She started off working in housekeeping and worked her way up to become a surgical tech. And that's how that developed. Okay, okay. So um, tell me more about race relations through your eyes as a child. So I guess this was the 50s and 60s. So tell me about what kinds of things do you remember? Well, I remember that we had what we called the black community and we had the white community. Um, and in the black community, we were a close family. We didn't have to go outside of our neighborhood to go to the grocery store. We had our own neighborhood grocery store. We had our own black drugstore. Um, it wasn't anything that we were actually missing. I mean, if we could go to the white store, we went. It was no problem. It was that we, we pretty much stayed to ourselves. You know, everybody looked out for each other. Um, so it was a community funded. It was community based. You okay. know, on the weekends, on Saturdays, we would go to the big grocery store to go grocery shopping on Saturdays. But during the week, and my dad worked at a grocery store, so we really didn't have to go to the white grocery store. So... It, it was it was different. Okay, okay, that sounds interesting. So tell me about your summers. Where did you go for the summer? Okay, for the summers, I would always go to New Orleans, Louisiana. And we lived in Baton Rouge at the time, so Baton Rouge is the capital. So, and every summer, my siblings and I, about three or four of us, we would drive down to New Orleans and spend the summer. My grandfather had the neighborhood grocery store. It was called Jackson Sweet Shop, and it was like the fourth building off the corner of um, 4th Street in Washington. So it was okay. a neighborhood that had an elementary a school there. So there was always children in and out of the, the grocery store. And my job was working the counter. I would always maintain the potato chips that used to have big jars of pickles on the counter and, and the soda machine, that type of thing. And my brother would do the cold cuts, slicing the cold cuts and keep the bread stopped and he would take care of the orders and I would sweep outside the door. He would sweep inside before closing. We all had our little duties, what we had to do. Okay, tell us more about your grandfather and your grandmother. My grandmother, she was a photographer. She, did, uh, she took pictures for Tulane University School of Medicine. Um, and her, the studio was called Frank B. Moore Studio and it was right across the street from the hospital. So all the residents would come over there to get their pictures taken. Okay. Her and this man that were worked at, his name was Solomon, just like my grandson. And so just those two worked there, and Miss, Miss Moore worked there. And uh, I would go, and it was downtown on Canal Street. So it was right across the street from Tulane University Hospital and uh, the shop. And sometimes during the summer, she would have me to come over and cut. I would trim, you know, the pictures and, and lay them out and stuff like that. So that was fun. And right next door was a jewelry store. And back then, my daddy was a jeweler. Okay. He was a jewelry store. So they didn't know if he was white or black, you know. So a lot of things he would tell us. And we would just go in the store next door. And he would say, just go in there and look and see if it's something you like. Then I would get it for you. So I, I saw this ring that I'd wanted. It was a little pearl ring and it had three little diamonds on the side. And to this day, I still have that ring. And he gave it to me when I was turned 16 years old. And he okay. said, you keep this ring, baby, because sometimes it's going to be worth something. And to this day, I still have that ring. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So tell us more about um, your grandfather. So he had, what was the name of the store again? It's called Jackson Sweet Shop. It was right on okay. Washington 4th Street. And my grandfather, he loved his Cadillacs. Okay. So they called him Cadillac Jack. 
So everybody knew that Mr. Jackson had his, and then I went that year, one year in my ninth grade, I went to McDonald 35. Some people might have called it McDougal, but it was, we pronounce it McDonald 35. And uh, the, the school was on Cadillac Street. And here comes Mr. Jackson with his brown and tan Cadillac. And so they would say, Brenda, that goes Mr. Jack and his Cadillac. You know, they would tease me, but you know, it was in a good way. You good know? fun, yeah. Yeah, and, and my grandmother always said, get in the back seat, never sit in the front. She always instilled that into me, even when I would come down on the Greyhound bus from Baton Rouge to New Orleans, she would always say, baby, you sit in the back seat, don't sit in the front, and don't look nobody in the eye. You look down, you know, and don't make any eye contact. And when you come straight to the house, and uh, I would pay for the taxi, you know, and we had a routine that I would come so often that the same guy would look for me every summer. Oh, I know mm -hmm. where she's going. She's going to Miss Jackson. Yeah. Okay. So was... And so back in Baton Rouge, where did you go to high school? Oh, I went to McKinley Senior High School. Mm -hmm. And now McKinley is what they call a, a magnet school. And back then we had McKinley and we had Capital. Those were the only two black high schools that we had. And so a lot of the black kids always tried to get to McKinley. But at that time, I was so naive. I didn't know anything. I just thought, well, I was going to McKinley. I would go to Capitol. What's wrong with Capitol? And the other kids would say, you go to a better school than we go to because over at McKinley, you all have econ uh, economics. You have uh, distributed education. You all can learn how to sew. You can get jobs. And, and I said, well, you all can too. They said, oh, no, no, no. Y'all school is different. And I What is distributive education? Distributed education is a class where you learn how to go to typing. You, it wasn't called computer at the time. It was like printing. It was like the industrial arts class. Okay. So you can go do, learn how to draw and outlines of buildings and stuff like that. So there were things that can prepare you to a job outside of that's where you're not going to college. At least you can go and take getting a government job, learning how to type. They would try to get you up to speed 45 words per minute without any mistakes. And they uh -huh. said, if you can do that, you can get a good government job back then. That was a big thing, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so that was, you know, home economics, learning how to sew, which I did. And right, I, right. What types of things did you get involved in, like extracurricular activities at school? I ran track. I ran track. I did home economics. Um, that basically. sounds good. And, and, I, and every summer, sometimes, too, I would do, during the school week on weekends, I did the Red Cross, the American Red Cross, the candy strikers okay. at the hospitals. Okay, so I, okay. I, I, yeah, I did that. So this and I remember the first time we had the rides when the Afros came out. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I just said, well, I'm going to do me an Afro. And everybody was teasing me. How are you going to get your hand the Afro? I said, I'm going to do like everybody else. I'm going to put it in some vinegar and some of this and some of that. Tighten it up. And some, used to call some braille cream. Braille, braille cream. It put a little dab of dew. It was a commercial. Say, use a little braille cream. And, it, and it, you, white people used to use it to make their hair stay in place. So I put a whole bunch of bird cream on my head and twist it all up and try to get a pick. And I tell you, that was the worst thing trying to get that stuff out your hair. But it, I, I had a, I had That's a your afro. <laughs> <laughs> what about um, when Martin Luther King died? When Martin Luther King died, it was just rioting everywhere. People were just on edge. And um, but I, like, well, like we said, with my dad, one day, one of his, my brother's friends came up to him and said, you know, I see this old man all the time, I always walking this old white man, we're going to jump him. And he said, well, what does he look like? So he described, he always wear these green pants, khaki pants all the time. And so the boy said, say, so my brother, his name was Leonard at the time. And as he got old, he changed it to Takuma. He said, man, that's my dad. He said, you better not mess with him. He said, if you think y'all got some burning going on, don't mess with him. He said, oh, man, I didn't know that was y'all dad. And ever since then, my dad was like protected, you know, hands off Mr. Levy. Hands off Mr. Levy. Y'all mess with everybody else, but don't mess with Mr. Levy. And even This has been such a great interview. I really appreciate it. Oh, um, you, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope and pray that the kids have an excellent school year, even though the terms and everything, the circumcisions are so different, but I know they're going to have a good time. Something different for everybody. So just hang in there. Be strong, and the God will continue to bless and keep us all safe. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Today we're going to interview our grandfather, but we know him as Papa. You might know him as Dr. Watkins. <laughs> so, what is your job? 
Uh, I'm a, a physician. Hmm, that's very interesting. Yep. We heard that you make awesome smoothies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do that also. <laughs> I love smoothies because smoothies are very, can be very nutritious, but I like them to taste good also. I also that's heard right. that you make, you like make some of your medicines. I think I heard that you make some of your medicines and like put your medicines in bottles yourself. Well, actually, I, I started out doing it myself, but um, I, 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 I did make up some formulas. I did research and develop formulas for different ailments, different diseases, different conditions. And we put them in capsules and we put them in bottles and we sell them to people. But I have people who actually make them for me. I don't make them myself anymore. Wow, it's always great to have medicine. So did anyone inspire you? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Did anyone inspire um, well, inspire me to become a physician. Um, I, I think when my mother, when I was a little boy, my mother was sick, um, and I felt very helpless. Um, I think that inspired me to want to be able to do something to help her. And I thought medicine would be the best way to do that. So that is amazing. But now here's the question everyone's been waiting for. Where did you go to college? Is I, went to, I went to Oakwood College, which is now Oakwood University. Who doesn't and, love Oakwood? Yes, and then for medical school, I went to Howard University College of Medicine. And then after, and after medical school, I did a five-year residency in surgery. Wow. Well, I want to be a doctor when I grow up, but, you know, the surgery stuff's in there, I'm still kind of scared of. <laughs> I used to think that I couldn't do surgery because they said your hands have to be steady, you know, and my hands used to shake a little. But actually, um, I, I learned to get steady hands, and I did very well as a surgeon. I honestly have very steady hands when I'm not concentrating on getting very steady hands. But when I'm concentrating on it, damn, my hands wobble. <laughs> well, you know, when, you, when you're trained, you know, um, you'll, you'll learn how to, to not be nervous because practice makes perfect. And, yes, so you, it really and then you have people who will train you who are very, very good. And so they will instill confidence in you so you'll be able to do a very good job. So, um, did your family immigrate to the United States? Well, um, my, my immediate family are all from the United States. Um, my mother um, was born, my mother and father were born in Virginia and then I grew up in, and I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and, and grew up in, in Ohio. So how many children did you have? I, I have three children. Um, the youngest being your father, but before him, I have two daughters, Kawana and Katara. Okay. What historical um, time period did you live in? Like, did you? Like, uh, sacred day? Well, I, 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 I was born in the, <laughs> in the, in, in, in the, in the forties. Um, but I grew up um, in the time of, of Martin Luther King uh -huh. and John F. Kennedy and you know, um, the riots, the early riots, um, all of that was occurring when I was in high school and in college. Oh my, well, that must have been very bad. 
heard a lot of shooting then and cannons booming and things like that. Well, there was no cannons, but um, in Cleveland, there were a lot of fires. Matter of fact, during the riots in Cleveland, I, I taught school that year. That was in 1968. I actually taught school that year. And um, I, I went down where the riots were. And so I was right there um, and asking them, why are you burning up your own community? If you're so bad, why don't you go burn up the other community, go downtown? and not burn up the black people's businesses. And after, after I thought about it, that, that could have been very dangerous, but um, that's what I said to them. Okay, and lastly, um, what advice would you give to the people of today? Well, I, I think the main thing is, is to um, ask God to direct you as to what you wanna do, uh, and then believe in yourself knowing that with God, there's nothing you cannot do. And this is from Dr. Watkins, signing off live at the Watkins houses. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Rep night will be cold, like it always is. <laughs>
want to thank GE Peters and the organizers of Grandparents Day for giving us this awesome opportunity to share some of our music with you on this Grandparents Day. And especially for our grandchildren, Alexa and Leah, I know y'all are shocked and surprised to see mom and papa show up virtually with you today, but we are so happy to be here. We want you to know we love you. God bless you. And to all of the grandparents, please have a great Grandparents Day and be safe. Wear your masks, wash your hands. God bless you. We love you. Enjoy your day. Evening. These are my grandparents. I call them Danny and Papa, and I'll be interviewing them for Grandparents Day. Okay, my first question is Where were you born? Okay, I was born in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I was born in Richmond, Virginia, also. Yeah, okay. And what was your house like as a child? Uh, as a child, my house was. Um, a lot of fun. There were six of us, and though we may not have had much, we didn't know that because we had each other, and there was just always so much fun and and um, love between us. So, as a child, I can say I had I was a happy child. What about you, honey? Well, um, I grew up in a household of five boys, no girls. So we had us a good time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we were always getting in trouble. And um, my mom, were, she was a single parent. And we were raised up in a, uh, area you call the projects. Okay. And uh, we enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed my uh, early childhood. I like to say I had a good time. And, uh, uh, and I uh, wouldn't get, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I enjoyed growing up in the projects and being with my brothers and everything. And you know when me and my brothers are still together now. Yes. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> okay. The second question is, what is different about growing up today than you were as a child? I think the, the biggest difference that I see is when I was growing up, you would always look outside and you would see children outside playing. You'd see children on their bicycles. Um, we could just leave our house. We were like excuse me, two blocks away from the playground. And my mom would just say, after we had breakfast and did our chores, we could go to the playground and play. And I, you know, I was probably at that time between six and eight years old. And we just, we didn't have to have supervision. We just ran to the playground and we could play for hours, but we knew when it was time to come home. For some strange reason, I don't know, I just had extra extra good hearing, my mom would call our names and remember with two blocks and we could hear her and we would run back home. And I think that that's one of the biggest differences because now you rarely see children, a, a lot of children outside playing. And we also didn't have toys. We made our toys. We made our toys out of grass or rocks. We just, we played hopscotch and use the rock as the ball. We just really got a chance to um, use our imagination so much more than the, the children um, of today. Okay. Um, what historical time period did you grow up in? Well, um, I can remember we, uh, growing up, my biggest remembrance is school segregation. I remember when we had to be um, sent to a different school on another side of town. Um, it was my first experience with actually being in school with white, white people. I had always grown up in a school that was all black and um, that, uh, that was um, quite different. Um, and I can remember my mom saying, we don't have a choice. This is what we have to do. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't know about um, prejudice or, you know, because of the color of the skin. We just knew children, kids. We were kids and we just instantly, we just got along and did what we normally do with all of, we did with all of our other friends. But the difference was 
we went home to a whole different area and they went home to another area. Whereas before segregation, we would all walk home together. And it's the same kids we played with at home, we also went to school with. So that was a difference because not all of us was sent to the same school. We were divided up. Mm -hmm. What about you, honey? Yeah, well, I grew up during the, uh, during the uh, Civil Rights Act before that. Uh, went to school, like your mom, uh, Gammy said, that we were attended school when it was, uh, when it was segregated. Um, mm -hmm. It was a different time when we had to go to school and uh, we were bus, like uh, Gammy said, we were bus a different school from out of our neighborhood. And that uh, separated the community a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, remember I said that we grew up in a very tight community, but when we had to go to different schools based on the segregation stuff, um, that really that really messed uh, things up for us. But um, mm -hmm. when we got from school, we came home and we were still, you know, we still became, uh, we were still close. But mm -hmm. um, during the Civil Rights Act, that was a time that we grew up in. And, uh, I remember my mom coming to D.C. or going to D.C. to um, see that uh, speech by um, Martha Luther King uh, during the 1963 here at the mm -hmm. um, Lincoln Memorial. And um, I think that was a very big time for her, you know, because I mean, it's, it affected us in so much, in so many ways, mm -hmm. you know, having him being a great speaker for us during that time. Yes, yes. Okay. Who is your favorite historical person from your time? Oh. Oh. I think for me, it was de definitely um, Martin Luther King. When I seen, I, I lived in an era where I can remember my mother saying, we were outside playing and she said, come in, come in. Because the Klan was, had a march right behind our home. And we didn't understand that, but they looked quite quite scary with their white hats and robes on. And we came in and then my mother started telling us about um, Martin Luther King and what he stood for, how he was really about justice and peace. And that we don't have to look at the situation around us in fear, but to look to God just as he always look to God for peace and to um, just, it kind of gave me a sense of, even at a young age, a sense of my mom explained it to where we weren't fearful. Mm -hmm. So I would have to say Martin Luther King. I would say Martin Luther King also, but mm -hmm. one of my favorites, you know, that I grew up with was Muhammad Ali. Ah. You know, I love boxing and he was one of my inspirations as far as uh, sports and boxing. And he he uh he stood up for what is right in his mind, you mm -hmm. know, for what he wanted to do. He did not let the um how would I say it? He did not let um politics get involved in what he wanted to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I yeah, Muhammad Ali was probably my favorite. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for letting me ask you these interview questions. Can't hear you. Oh, thank Maybe. you so much for letting me ask you these interview questions. Oh, you're oh, welcome. It was our pleasure. Now, can I ask a question? Yes. Do you do you uh, pay us for this or? Oh. Will we get a piece of cake? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Love you, girl. Love you. Bye-bye, Bye. <laughs> Hey, my name is Ryan Jeffrey, and I have the privilege of interviewing one of my childhood heroes, my father, Harry Jeffrey. Okay, well, first of all, um, I want to thank you for inviting me to uh, record something for Grandparents Day for the Children at GE Peters. I just want to jump right in and ask, uh, where were you born? And where was I born? In a very historic place, Berkeley, California, at the University mm -hmm. of uh, uh, California at Berkeley Hospital. You know, the more uh, liberal movements that were uh, fighting for equality got started in the Berkeley, California area. Now, we live, but I was born in um, Berkeley, lived in East Oakland, the uh, home of the Black Panthers. 
that was that was the epicenter of a lot of initiatives and protests taking place during the civil rights movements as a kid what was it like growing up in the neighborhood uh in the black community during that time before i even get into that i would like to offer our condolences and so forth to um, the family of chadwick bozeman who played the mythical black panther but that movie also had some correlation to the actual black panther party the neighborhood was um, a segregated neighborhood in Oakland and it was in a part of Oakland where um, there were still a few, um, you know, white people in the neighborhood that, you know, were kind of like still leaving as uh, black people were moving in. And, uh, we uh, were not allowed to uh, rent or buy houses in a lot of the other areas in Oakland. So we were really concentrated in that area. and. Um, I think one of the advantages of being segregated in that area in the black community was the fact that uh, since no one could live anywhere else, we all lived in the same community. And so whether you were poor as dirt like my family was, or whether you uh, were a doctor or a lawyer or a school teacher or a blue collar worker, white collar worker or whatever, we all lived in the same neighborhood. And so um, no matter what your social economic position was your, or status was in that community, you still had role models and stuff all up and down the street. And the neighborhood raised all of the children. If I went and got in trouble down the street at somebody's house, they would spank me and send me home. But by the time I got home, they had called my parents and then I would be in trouble again when I got home. Wow. And, and the other advantage of that was that um, they share a lot. And so the more well-off families, they, their parents made sure that we could go to outings with their children and so forth, things that our parents couldn't afford to do. And so we were exposed to a lot of different things and they mentored us and so forth. And so I, I became the president of the NAACP youth group. Wow. High school. And uh, this was the charter um, group. Uh, in the Fresno, California. We were the first, very first NAACP youth group in uh, Fresno, so I was the charter president. What and were um, what were some of the main issues that you all were fighting for? Uh, we were just fighting for just getting mutual respect and just being treated fairly. I mean, the, uh, we were uh, fortunate to have a Black Studies department that had very outstanding um, professors and the people that were teaching us our history as it really went down. So we were being exposed to black history in the United States and around the world for really the first time. And so we uh, just were involved in all kinds of situations that uh, were taking place on campus, like the, the professors that were uh, deliberately flunking students who really should not have been flunked and giving them a hard time and giving them lower grades on their papers and things like that. And um, then the um, uh, their different uh, social things around the campus that would take place that had, you know, racial overtones to them and so forth. And uh, we just found that we were constantly fighting inequality and prejudice and bias in almost every aspect of college life and in the surrounding community around the college. Um, there's been a lot of different takes on what the Black Panther Party was all about. Um, you know, you have the images of the, the Black men in the streets holding the rifles and everything like that. But as somebody who was actually there saw the kind of work that they were doing in the community, what, um, from your perspective, what kind of work did you see them doing uh, for the community? One of the things that I remember about growing up in East Oakland is that the police were always so abusive and disrespectful to black people. I mean, and, and they, they were just always beating black people and uh, taking them to jail for no reason at all, harassing us when we went up and down the streets. Even little kids were being harassed by the police. I just witnessed so much unfairness and brutality and disrespect from the police. So the Black Panther Party got started as the police department 
for the black community to protect mm. us from the Oakland Police Department. Wow. And they started out as a very disciplined group. I mean, Bobby Seale and, uh, and Huey uh, uh, Newton and, and the other founders of the party there in Oakland, they learned all of the laws and codes and everything for the municipality of Oakland, California and the state of California and so forth, so that they knew what they could do and what they could not do, what their rights were and you know so forth. And when the police tried to tell them that they were not allowed to have a certain uh, type of weapon and so forth displayed and so forth, they could just cite the code back to, well, municipal code, so and so and so and so and so, so, uh, number and so forth, you know, says wow. that. And some of the police didn't even know the code as well as the Black Panther Party did. And they would have to call in <laughs> to find out whether what was being recited to them by them. <laughs> this was actually true. <laughs> wow. Wow. And it would just be baffled with their mouths hanging open. But the Black Panther Party started to protect the uh, Black citizens of Oakland, California from the brutality of the police department and to take care of the social ine ine inequities that were taking uh, place in the community. They started feeding programs to make sure that all of the children had food to eat and so forth. In the schools, they went into the schools and started feeding programs and things. And in the community, they started community centers with after school tutoring and after school child care and so forth to make sure the kids were being educated properly and things like that. They were just involved in all kind of great things like that in the community. And that's how they started a very disciplined and a very community uh, minded uh, in uplifting uh, group of people. They were not thugs. <laughs> they mm -hmm. thugs at all as they were being portrayed. Now, once J. Edgar Hoover, who was the um, leader of the FBI during that particular period of time, declared that the Black Panther Party was one of the biggest threats to the security of the United States of America and started his war against the Black Panther Party, that's when things started going downhill. Because what the FBI did was they started infiltrating the party with their people who were just going in there to make trouble mm. and caused a lot of dissension and so forth. And, um, and at that point, you know, they were just being set up for all kind of crimes and things that, uh, you know, really would not have been happening if it wasn't for the people that were being planted in the party to start trouble. Like the issue of police brutality, for instance, it never went away, you know, it right. just wasn't being put out there. It wasn't until technology <laughs> and people started having video cameras, like where the first case was Rodney King in Los Angeles, California, when, you know, someone had a video camera in case. That was happening and it has continued to happen all the way up until today. The difference is that people always believed the police. They didn't uh, believe the community. They mm -hmm. always thought the community was lying and the police were telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And now with the cameras everywhere and people being able to video things and upload them to the web or whatever in um, real time, the rest of America is now seeing with their own eyes what we have been experiencing all along. Mm -hmm. and not new to us but they just believed the police all the time and did not believe the community. And it's a parallel to the civil rights um, era when they started uh, saying different things about what was actually going on down south and the rest of the American community didn't really believe it was that bad. But once those network TV cameras went down there, into the south when uh, martin luther king and others were marching and protesting and saw those police dogs being sicked on people and saw people being knocked down with water hoses and beat with billy clubs and so forth and saw just for marching and asking for their rights to be respected and to be granted to them uh that was when the conscience of america got pricked because the cameras went down there same thing is happening now with the technology, with everybody having a smartphone 
with a video camera in it and so forth. Now that the rest of America is actually seeing with their own eyes what has been happening to us all along, now the conscience of America has been pricked once again. James, what, what advice can you give them to, to keep the ball moving forward? Okay, well, education. And I'm talking about a true, pure education that doesn't whitewash <laughs> the true history is very important. And another good thing about being in the United States of America is the founding document, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the amendments and everything, the, the uh, Bill of Rights and so forth. All of that is law. And so we in this country have documents that we can use in our fight to make the rest of the country live up to its creed. And I just want to thank again our guest, Harry Jeffrey, grandparent of Ryan Jeffrey. Thank you so much for sharing your insight and wisdom from your experience, uh, because it really applies a lot to us today. So thank you so much for being with us. And thank you so much for having me. Hello, GE Peters. Wasn't that such a great program? We thank all of our participants for participating in our virtual grandparents program. We especially thank our grandparents we appreciate you taking the time to share your stories. We know that your experiences add so much to our life lessons, and we thank you for sharing your stories. At this time, G. E. Peters, let's show our appreciation for our grandparents and all of our participants by giving them a huge round of applause. Ms. Jeffrey also would like to acknowledge our students for working towards 100 Days of Excellence. Last week, I brought up that when you work very hard every day, boys and girls, it will add to our 100 Days of Excellence. And right now, our benchmark is getting to 30 Days of Excellence. And so last week, our teachers reported that we all earned five days of excellence for week one. And for week two, we also earned five days of excellence. Way to go, boys and girls. You're doing a great job. So that gives us a total of 10 days of excellence so far. And when we get to 30, we're going to celebrate and do something special. So keep working hard and show excellence each and every day. Now I would like to acknowledge our September birthdays. Happy birthday to Pearson Page, whose birthday was September 2nd. Happy birthday to Aaliyah Powell whose birthday is September 4th. Happy birthday to Ezra Smith, whose birthday was September 4th. Happy birthday to Jaden Brown, whose birthday is September 5th. And happy birthday to Christopher Jeffrey, whose birthday is September 6th. And the greatest gift ever is being with you, G.E. Peters. At this time, I want to acknowledge all our September birthdays this week by singing our happy birthday song. So join with me, boys and girls. You ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, September birthdays. Happy birthday to you. Well, 
boys and girls, that's all for our, our program today. I hope you enjoyed it. Have an excellent rest of the day, and Miss Jeffrey will see you again soon. Bye. Happy birthday. Principal Jeffrey. We love you. From eighth grade. Miss Jeffrey. Happy birthday. Miss Jeffrey. We love you. From the sixth Bye. 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 Miss Jeffrey. We love you. From the seventh grade class. Miss Jeffrey. We love you. From the seventh grade class. Yay! Bye. 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 Bye.